This is Debbie Dashinger inviting you to join me and some amazing presenters aboard the Galactic Origin Celebrity Cruise to the Yucatan in December. Go to D-E-B-B-I, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash cruise. Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashinger, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hey there, hi there, ho there. This is Debbie Dashinger and welcome to the show. Today I'm going to be speaking with Mike Rexetter. He's going to be talking to us regarding the secrets of real time travel. Love that conversation already. And folks, if you're out there, if you're joining new, for everybody who tunes in, and thank you so much for your comments, your likes, your subscribes. It's so important you do this because you're essentially, every time you like the show, you're sharing it with somebody matrix-wise who wouldn't have heard this program previously, but is really hungry for this kind of connection, community, and information. This show won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards, the COVR Award for Best Podcast, Welp Magazine named Dare to Dream, one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it's high ranking on Apple Podcasts. So we're here on YouTube, Spotify, on video, and on all major podcast sites. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work out into the world. If you would like to be a facilitator or take one of their classes, go to drdanehere.com and sign up today. If you'd like to know what your galactic history is, forget about the earth history, right? And what your ancestry is. What about our galactic lineage? I've got an amazing video and a report that breaks down over 19 different galactic beings of which you are probably at least one. Learn about it. Learn all your traits, your strengths, your weaknesses, what you look like physically, what you're probably doing for work, and even more. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash starseed and download your copy today, my gift to you, Learn Your Star Lineage. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash starseed. Also a really important note, I'm very excited. I'm opening up many different varieties of webinars coming up. And most notably, starting very soon, I'm going to be sharing free webinars with all of you. And you know where my wheelhouse is, which is shamanism added to extraterrestrials, where they intersect, why this information is so very important for all of us today, humanity and the earth, and how we can write our timeline. So I'm sharing all new information, haven't gone here before in any of my previous classes or programs. And if you'd like to join for free, just sign up at debbiedashinger.com. There's free gifts for you there anyway. And when you sign up, you'll be on the list so you can join these webinars. And there's more coming down the pike. You want to start with a free one. And then I'm also offering a 90-minute shamanic healing for you guys, a group setting. That'll be in 2025. Um but it's all in place already. And one more thing that is noteworthy and super exciting. I know you guys hear me say, I've been doing this show for 17 years and you've heard me year after year before February, this time February, 2025 is going to be yet again, the 23rd annual Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo. Best event for our tribe. You have to come. (laughs) You must come. It's phenomenal. And in fact, our guest is going to be speaking there. So you want to hear him. Come see him in person. And many of the guests that are coming on right now, I'm also speaking Friday night and moderating panels while I'm there. So I'd love to meet you. Let me know you came because of the show. I'm going to have a link so you can get your tickets for the LA Conscious Life Expo in the show notes and or description. Well, exciting stuff. Mike Ricksecker is an acclaimed author and researcher known for his works, including Portals to the Stars, his latest book, Gates of the Anunnaki, 
Astral Genesis, and the award-winning Travels Through Time. Mike has written several Amazon bestsellers, such as A Walk in the Shadows and Alaska's Mysterious Triangle, along with numerous historic paranormal books. Mike has appeared on popular shows like History Channel's Ancient Aliens, Gaia TV, and Travel Channel's The Alaska Triangle. He also produces and directs the docuseries The Shadow dimension available on various streaming platforms where he shares insights on ancient wisdom and the supernatural through his extensive YouTube channel. If you'd like to learn more about him, go to his website, which is his name, MikeRickSecker.com. And with that, I welcome Mike to the Dare to Dream show. It's awesome to have you here today. Thanks for time traveling just to be here. (laughs) Uh, Thank you so much for having me today, Debbie. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to the conversation. Me too. I'm going to start not quite on the time travel, but I was really taken in your bio by this Alaska's mysterious triangle. And the reason why, besides it's fascinating, it caught my eye is I'm going to be speaking in December on a galactic origins cruise. And this is going specifically to the Yucatan. And this is going to be our first day at sea, we are traveling through the Bermuda Triangle, which is very exciting and very spooky. Uh, Do you know about that? Is, do you have any information about the Bermuda Triangle we may not know yet? Yeah. I mean, I I cover uh, the Bermuda Triangle in part in Alaska's Mysterious Triangle, as well as in part in my latest work, Portals to the Stars. And these triangle areas are, they're all over the world. So I get asked a lot, you know, the Alaska Triangle, is that like the Bermuda Triangle? It's, well, yeah, you know, and ish, ish, yeah. When they were first um, realizing uh, the strange things that happened up there, they were finally like connecting all the dots. Uh, They actually called it the uh, Alaska's Bermuda Triangle, which is a little odd to say but um but yeah like you have the dragon's triangle out there by japan you have the lake michigan triangle um all these different areas all over the world that we've just kind of given the nomenclature of triangle but you know really what it is are these you know hot spot areas of energy where strange things happen it all starts down at the earth's core which is a uh, molten ball of iron that is spinning around and creating a uh, a magnetic wave so to speak coming through the earth uh, and that creates our magnetic shield which is good news because that keeps us um, protected from the uh, harmful uh, solar winds but as it's passing through the earth's mantle and crust it's interacting with different metals and minerals and depending on what it interacts with and the quantity of it it creates these different localized electromagnetic fields and that's where the strange things start occurring so bermuda is definitely one of those areas And I lost your volume, Debbie. Oops, sorry. What is your background <laughs> that you talk about these things? Are you credentialed or did you go to university about these subjects? Well, yeah, my <laughs> my degree is actually in uh, simulation programming. So I co- actually come from an IT background. Mm. Uh, and as far as the writing aspect, I've been writing ever since I was a kid. Uh, it's just, you know, these topics have always fascinated me. So these are things that I have studied while I have, you know, my uh, professional career was elsewhere, but I've encountered a lot of um, strange things along the way. I started really as an experiencer as a child. So these things have always been with me. I've always fascinated me. Can you be a little more explicit experiencer of what specifically? Yeah. um, Well, it's really was one of those, um, you know, shadow people experiences so and that's and that's why i ended up writing my book a walk in the shadows was um you know from that first early experience other experiences i'd had uh growing up and then uh kind of uh working as a working but um i was a paranormal investigator for many years and so i had a lot of experiences there but the first one uh when i was eight years old kind of that typical story of waking up in the middle of the night and there's this tall dark shadow standing in the corner of my bedroom and you know at first i'm not i'm eight i'm not thinking shadow person or anything like that i'm thinking somebody's broken into the house and they're here to you know 
steal something or maybe even kill me because that's where your mind goes at, at that age. So I'm trying to scream. Nothing's coming out of my mouth because I'm just too terrified. This thing approached my bed, leans over, and I'm staring into this blank black face. There's nothing there. No eyes, no, no mouth, nothing. And then it's something really unusual. It grabbed me by the wrists, crossed my arms across my body, and then ran off down the hall. By that point, I found my voice, found my legs, ran off screaming to my parents' bedroom. And, um, you know, they tried to call me down, console me, trying to tell me that I just had a bad dream. But I knew I hadn't had a bad dream. I'd been awake for this entire incident. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of where my my journey really began and eventually became a walk in the shadows, became uh, my docuseries, uh, The Shadow Dimension, and so forth. And did you ever find out what this being was? So... What I did um, some years back now, because I had, you know, f for a long time, I was I was terrified of that incident. Although when we moved out of that house, moved into, uh, we'd moved from Massachusetts to Ohio. Um, and that was a one-off, by the way. It was the only time that ever happened in that house in Massachusetts. When we moved to Ohio into this, uh, into this new house, there was shadow activity that was going on there that was actually pretty consistent, but it was very, very different. Um, this this thing was more translucent in nature, where the other one was very solid. Um, it was you could almost say it was skittish because you would um, you would look at it and you'd see it run down the hall. Um, my mom had seen this thing too, so that was it wasn't just me. Uh, so very, very different. And I actually got playful with it because it would just kind of uh, you know peek in my room and I would call it Tom, like peeping Tom, because that's kind of what it was doing. Like, Hi, Tom. And off would go. Um, so, you know, I'd had these different experiences and talking with other people about it over the years, you know, a lot of different theories. And I started becoming less and less terrified of that first event. Like one of the theories was, well, you know, maybe it thought you, you were dead and was putting you to a burial post, like, you know, a uh, crook and flail out of ancient Egypt. And it's like, oh, that's an interesting idea. So, uh, some years back now, I had a uh, hypnotic regression to uh, take me back to that event and find out what really happened. And it was really, really fascinating because um, the hypnotherapist was actually able to channel that specific entity and actually bring that entity into uh, the hypnosis session. So I actually got to see everything from the perspective of that entity, like in that moment for back when I was eight years old, it was really fascinating because of basically looking down at my little eight year old self, which was really strange. But, um, I also got to feel the emotions of this, this being as well. And without going into an extreme amount of detail, basically what I got out of this session was that, um, this was something that we would call it from another dimension. Although I kept saying it was, it was from another space, another space. Mm -hmm. We would, uh, the hypnotherapist Ariana would ask, well, you mean another dimension? And we'd say, no, I'm from another space, which was really interesting. But and so it traveled here from somewhere, basically on a research mission to study humanity. And it had an assignment that night of the bedroom of a human child. And it didn't realize at first that it could see me. And when it realized that I could, and I was becoming frightened, what it was trying to do uh, was kind of put me into a self hug and I got to see that it actually patted my wrists and then it ran off to get out of there and stop scaring me. Oh, that is so healing. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah it was amazing. really cathartic to, to get, to get that and be able to see it from a whole new perspective. Yeah. I mean, cause something like that could mess somebody up for the rest of their yeah. life. That one incident at eight, you can make a lot of decisions about what that was, why it was, what actually happened and how unresolved that was. Will it come back? And that can plague somebody. But the fact, well, first of all, good on you for even thinking of the hypnosis and doing it, having that kind of curious mind. And then to have that level of being, that person who can channel for you, and then you experiencing the being, that's really amazing. I And just as a follow-up, do you know, has it this um, dark being from another space, has it followed you at all through life? Has it tracked you? Have you had any other contact? No, not with that specific being other than through the hypnosis session. It was, it was only ever in my room, in my space, that one time yeah it, it did not follow me throughout life or anything like that but um but it was really helpful for me to be able to make 
peace in that moment with what happened. And yeah. So now I talk about it all the time. That's so cool. Well, your book travels through time. There's a quote, and I want to share this with you and ask you a question. And the quote is, consider that there is a real world outside of our own, far beyond the dimensional boundaries of the physical universe. It might not be a computer, but there is some sort of mechanism that we don't quite understand, which has brought our consciousness into this world. Will you break that mechanism idea down for us as best you understand it? Yeah, this is where my experience with uh, simulation programming and, and my IT background comes into play because uh, ever since the Matrix movies came out, uh, there's been this prevailing thought that you know perhaps we are living within a computer simulation. And I do believe it is some sort of simulation, but again, not necessarily a computer simulation. Uh, you know, we have so many of our ancient religions talk about us being in a simulation without using that word. So the idea of reincarnation, that we come from some sort of homeworld, come down into this world, live out our lives, have some experiences, learn some things, we pass away, we go back home. We're there for a while and then we come back. So it's that recurring cycle again and again. Even Christianity talks about us being in this world right now, preparing for the next world. So we're going somewhere else after this. Um, so, so we have that kind of embedded within our religion, religions without using the word simulation. So what I mean by I don't believe it's a computer simulation is we tend to uh, attribute things that we don't quite understand to whatever our you know, maximum technology is at this particular point in time. So right now that's computers. So, you know, we've kind of broken these different things down into, well, you know, this could be a, you know, some sort of sophisticated computer because that's where our understanding is right now. We understand how uh, computer simulations work and things like this, whether it's in a, uh, could be a game environment, could even be like a flight simulator environment, these sorts of things. So, um, I, I believe that our, uh, our belief in that is a bit narrow sighted, that it is something far more advanced that we can't comprehend right now. So, uh, you take a look at the, the works of, um, Nikola Tesla and different things that he talked about. Uh, and he was, he was essentially talking, uh, about things like, you know, artificial intelligence before, there was even such a thing that existed. Uh, he created really the world's first drone back in the 1890s. And he told people, look, I could, you know, take this and, you know, have it make its own decisions. Uh, it could, it, the idea of this drone was, a, it was basically like a little boat, almost like a little submarine. This was during the Spanish-American War. And his idea was for humans not to have warfare, let the machines do it. And, you know, put artificial intelligence into this machine that it could, you know, know where to target, know where to, um, where to sail, when to fire torpedoes, that sort of thing. And then he said, look, I could take that same technology. He called it a telautomaton. I could build a telautomaton of myself, you know, and give it, give it my own likeness and make it make decisions based on the things that I would do, all this sort of thing. And he was essentially by talking about this, talking about artificial intelligence, making a robot of himself with artificial intelligence. But in his day and age, he's thinking it's going to be gears and wheels and radio waves. The silicon microchip wasn't invented until 16 years after he died. So he did not know what the technology was going to be, but he had the ideas and concepts. So I believe same thing with us when we're talking about living in a simulation. We have the ideas and concepts, but we don't understand that technology yet and what it would really take to make that. Yeah, it's so fascinating when you say that. I also have studied Nikola Tesla and I talk about him in my work from a different point of view, from a shamanistic point of view, mm -hmm. fascinating individual, Absolutely. fascinating life, right? Terrible businessman, but oh, a yeah, fascinating <laughs> He was swindled business. so much, but he still yeah. became a millionaire because of all his incredible inventions. Mm -hmm. But there is no doubt his mind was not on the same same human wavelength. Yeah. It was he was receiving information definitely from 
you know, way beyond other dimensions. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I love that you use him in your work. And I've heard this theory you're talking about. I think mm -hmm. anyone who is metaphysical in these days, spiritual, hears that. One is, you know, we go back to the all that is, the source. And the other one is that there is something that keeps replicating our soul, if you will, over and over again. And so is there a way to get out of the system that you know of that we end that perpetual coming back? Yeah, that's a good question because there is some sort of rule set that is applied to this universe. And I get into that a bit when I start talking about time where, uh, you know, we're, even though all time is here, it's all concurrent past, present, future, you know, all right now, um, we're stuck in this rule set of the what we call the river of time. And so I use the analogy of, uh, you know, time is the water, but it's not the water that makes itself run. It's the banks that's holding the, they're hold, that's holding the water in place to make it flow. If you remove the banks, which is that rule set, then all the water would spill out and it'd be, you know, like a giant lake or a pond was ever present and you can move, you know, between each uh, part of the pond as, as you want. But it's the banks of that river. That's the rule set that keeps it going. And so, yeah, it's an excellent question. If if I knew what that rule set was that was keeping us perpetually going in a cycle, um, I probably would have tried uh, jumping out of that just to see, you know, what was beyond. <laughs> um, so that's kind of one of the big mysteries of the universe. What is that aspect? But it, it is there. There's some sort of rule set in place. Right. And we'll all find out. <laughs> right. We'll eventually find out. Yeah. <laughs> some decades soon. Um, and so what about ancient symbolism and alchemy? Do they play a part in this? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, our most ancient alchemical symbol, uh, the Ouroboros, which is the snake eating, eating its own tail, uh, that is the uh, symbol of constant recycle and renewal. So uh, the the ancients used this in place of not just life, because and they obviously did that as well, where uh, they, the first occurrence that we find of it is on the burial shrine of Tutankhamun, where they have the Ouroboros over his head, over his feet. And yeah, they wanted their, um, they wanted their king to, you know, come back to life, be resurrected, have another life, be recycled, that sort of thing. But they also applied this to earth and they also applied this to the universe. Yeah. That constantly coming back and coming back. And we even find it's, uh, Reference in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and not even not specifically saying Ouroboros, but using that uh, that symbol of the serpent. So when uh, you find it in the papyrus of Ani, where Ani is before Atom, who's the creator god, and he's talking about you know what will be you know the span of my life, and he's talking about it'll be for millions on years, on millions and millions of years. So giving us the idea of the layering of time. But then Atom talks about returning the earth to the primordial waters. So, you know, basically kind of the destruction of the earth. And we see this like in the imagery of Atlantis and these sorts of things. So bringing the earth back to the waters for it to be reborn again. And then Atom is going to take the, um, he's going to take the body of a, of a serpent. So this is where we get that, uh, that symbolism of the serpent and that symbolism of the recycling and renewal of, of the planet and of the universe. Yeah, absolutely. And anybody who follows Graham Hancock's work or, you know, some of the major archaeologists who talk about, you know, we've had history all wrong. There's actually been major destruction of our entire civilization several times mm -hmm. throughout our history and that our history is way deeper and longer than we know. But these places they are finding, these old structures and all the work they're doing, they're gathering amazing information about how we have destroyed and rebirthed, destroyed and rebirthed yeah. over our entire history. Yeah, absolutely. I love Graham's work. I love how he talks about, you know, we're a species with amnesia. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's he's not the first person to to say that. So we, we actually, if we go back to Plato's work, uh, the uh, Timaeus and Critias talking about uh, the Atlantis story when, uh, you know, he's recounting the journeys of Solon, who had gone to Egypt in 600 AD and brought back, or uh, 600 BC, sorry, and had brought back the Atlantis story. Now, when Solon was down there in Egypt, uh, he'd gone to the temples at Sais and Heliopolis, and at Sais, 
he's talking with this uh, priest by the name of Sanchez. And, uh, you know, they're discussing different philosophical uh, ideas. And Solon is telling Sanchez about uh, about the great flood and the survivors and all this. And, and Sanchez is kind of laughing at him. He says, Solon, Solon, uh, you Greeks are but children. You know, you're only talking about one cataclysm. There have been many cataclysms. This has happened over and over and over again, and even go so far as to describe that uh, the more learned people of <clears throat> of Greece, or at least of that area of the world, when they were wiped out, it was the people living in the mountains and the sheep herders that survived, and they, they were unlearned, and so they weren't aware of all the previous ones, and they just kind of had to restart everything all over again. Um, so it's it's interesting how you know we find that in our ancient texts. Uh, so it's right there, uh, one of our most famous philosophers talking about it, and here's Graham trying to put all this information out there, and he's they're they're trying to burn him in mass media, which is unfortunate. Oh my God, that whole paradigm. I don't know. I almost feel like it makes him look even better. All these archaeologists who I don't know what they're so afraid of that they wouldn't even invent. I mean, at the very worst or best, just investigate on yourself. Prove them wrong. Like yeah. you do the science, right? You meet with some of these experts. I think what he's doing is so commendable and that he doesn't mm -hmm. back down. And thank you, Netflix, for continuing to support him. Yes. Thank you, Joe Rogan, for continuing to support him. It's really important information right now. And we're living in a time as we see so many institutions crumble right now. Mm -hmm. And we're being told all the time that what is to come is transparency and authenticity and things that are not truth will fall away. So the fact that he continues on this path, I think is so commendable, right? He's, it it I, really is, especially with all the scrutiny that, that he's faced. And, you know, and I, I understand it. He's, he's not from the institution that, you know, they have all these gatekeepers, you know, he's an investigative journalist. That's how he got his start. And so like when you're asking me before about, you know, are you credentialed? And it's like, well, no, um, not in these specific areas, but you know, I'm a, I'm a smart guy. Same with, uh, same with Cram. You know, he was, you know, he worked you know, he wrote for, uh, magazines, he wrote for newspapers and he was being sent out to these different areas of the world. And he was just, you know, watching and observing and noticing all these different connections. And he started writing about those things. And so, yeah, very intelligent guy. He's making the connections and he's letting others know about it. And it's, it's unfortunate, but it's what a lot of the, uh, today's traditional science has done is they have essentially taken the place of the old church. You know, these two areas that keep butting heads and they're actually doing the same thing where, you know, hundreds of years ago, if you were hearing voices, if you were biolocating, if you were levitating, these sorts of things, <laughs> if you were a member of the clergy and part of the church, it was okay because mm -hmm. it was for God. But if you were outside the church, a commoner or, or something like that, uh, you it was witchcraft and you're going to get hung or burned at the stake. Uh, and that's what you know modern science is doing today to somebody like Graham. But instead of you know literally burning him at the stake, burning him in mass media. So, uh, but kudos to him for keeping at it. I agree and leveling the playing field. You know, me too, Mike. I mean, I come from USC, a performing arts background, and here I am talking about shamanism and extraterrestrials. I didn't major in extraterrestrials, right. but. I have, I am a journalist, I'm an aggregator, and that's exactly what I do. I am certified in shamanism, yes. I never lived in the jungles, no, right? And I, I don't come from that lineage, certainly in this lifetime, but um, I've done as much as I can right now to get as credentials as I can in those things. But the rest of it is fascination, curiosity, and a yeah. knowing. Like there are patterns I start seeing and then I have to find out more and that leads me into fascinating territories. So I very much relate to what you're saying about yourself and Graham and I think a lot of people in our space. Um, there's, I think there's a higher reason why we're doing what we're doing. There's a higher calling to how we step into this so big. So I absolutely agree with you, yeah.
Yeah. And so th here's a really interesting question for you, because you talk about time travel and, and it's the title, The Secrets of the Time Travel. And I, I wouldn't ask you that grand a question because I'm sure there's many, many, but can you offer us one or two secrets of time travel that we might not be aware of that might be surprising to us? Yeah. Um, when it comes to time travel, uh, people generally think of, you know, hopping into a machine like, you know, back to the future. Let's jump into DeLorean, whisk off at 88 miles per hour. We've got our flux capacitor and boom, off we go. And I, I really don't think it's going to be like that. I, I, I think real time travel has more to do with the consciousness than it does ha have to do with um, a machine. And because it comes down to kind of like Tesla always said, you know, it always comes down to frequency, energy, resonance, vibration. And so uh, within my idea of, of stack time theory, uh, in which, you know, kind of in similar veins to Einstein's idea of the block universe, where all time is present, past, present, and future, to me, each of those moments are all here concurrently, each moment like a photograph in a giant stack of photos, you know, take where you're sitting right now, it's all there. But each of those moments is resonating at a little bit of a different frequency. So real time travel would be syncing up from whatever moment that you're in and jumping into a different frequency and syncing up your frequency with that of one of these other moments in time. And we see this play out sometimes in what we call a time slip. So one of the most famous ones, the Versailles time slip where you have the two uh, school headmistresses, they're walking through the gardens at Versailles, and then all of a sudden the scene morphs into existence of like pre-French uh, Revolution era, something like that. So their frequency suddenly became in sync with the frequency of another point in time. So I think that is what real time travel is going to be, where um, technology might come into place here just a little bit would be to try to uh, keep those frequencies in sync. So maybe some little device or whatever that uh, you're, you're tuning into that frequency and you're able to hold it a little bit longer to spend more time there. But other than that, yeah, I think it just comes down to, to, you know, meditation and your, your specific resonance and frequency. You write in your book that we have a personal resonance as a human being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that resonance ranges from 9 to 16 hertz. And with one single hertz representing one event or one cycle per second. So when we are witnessing phenomena such as you have described, we're actually synchronizing with it. Can you tell us about that, exp explaining the units of frequency and how that works? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, everybody resonates a little bit differently. And this uh, these were... Um, so, so scientific research done back in the 90s where they, they came up with these numbers and all this. And everybody's a little bit different. Um, you know, I, I might be you know, resonating somewhere around 10. Somebody else could be around 14 or whatever. And an example I like to use with this goes back to um, my days uh, doing some paranormal investigations. And we had been running an event one night at uh, Mineral Springs Hotel in Alton, Illinois. And Fantastic venue, but uh, it's supposed to be a very haunted location, and the top floor is abandoned. Um, they've, they've been trying to renovate parts of it over the years, but uh, we were running. It was later at night. Um, another thing that really helped with uh, with all this is earlier in the evening, there had been a, it was beautiful, it was a, um, a lightning storm that was over the Mississippi River. The sky turned purple and all this stuff. Uh, so it was one of those type of evenings that kind of really set the mood. But um, we were upstairs top floor uh, is a corner suite. It's called Pearl's room. Uh, unfortunately, there was a confirmed suicide in that room. And a lot of people have said that it's a very, very active room. So we were in there uh, doing some work with electronic voice phenomena. And all of a sudden, I hear some noises coming uh, from out in the hall. So I head out to the hallway to see what's going on out there. And at the end of the hall, I see this smoke that's starting to billow up. And I'm like, well, what's going on down there? You know, it's a place on fire. I'm not smelling anything, but, you know, you're seeing this smoke. It's like, okay, this, what, what's happening here? Smoke keeps coming closer and closer down the hall. And it starts doing something very unusual. It starts creeping up the wall on the right-hand side, creeping back down, creeping back up, creeping back down, all the while coming closer and closer. And then 
one of those times that crept up that wall on the right hand side, it morphed into the apparition of a little girl. And all the others had joined me by then. There were five of us there and they all saw this little girl and were kind of trying to coax her to come closer, come closer. And she stopped right at this uh, doorway to, uh, uh, to another room that many people in the past had said that you know, there had been the sightings of a little girl in this particular room. So it's like, okay, we're actually seeing the little girl right outside the door. But we all saw her a little bit differently. So I saw her fully formed from her head all the way down to about her knees, and then she kind of dissipated away. Other people saw her fully formed at the feet, and then kind of, as you worked up, dissipated away uh, toward her head. So it kind of adheres to that idea that we all resonate at a different frequency. So we weren't none of us were fully tuning into because she also had her own resonance right and so we weren't uh fully uh tuning into her we're all tuning in a little bit differently because we all have our own personal resonance Mm. oh my gosh you're a brave man for sure i would have been (laughs) fing gone um that's so fascinating the whole idea i mean i've actually gotten more comfortable the older i get the whole idea of ghosts and spirits and Mm -hmm. um yeah they're usually not here to hurt us. I, well, they're not. I mean, and here's what it is, um, at least my belief on, on this whole matter. And it does relate to, you know, talking about time in different dimensions. We have up to, uh, according to our uh, theoretical physics, we have up to 11 dimensions, zero through 10. Zero being a point, one being a line, two being a plane, flat plane, three being a three-dimensional object, four is time. And that's where our consciousness resides. And we're we're fascinating beings because we are multidimensional in that our fourth dimensional consciousness is inside a three-dimensional body. So when the three-dimensional body passes, when that dies, our fourth dimensional consciousness is still here, still around. Now we could move on to wherever that is, we're talking about it earlier, where do, we, you know, where do we go? That's kind of like the big question. Is it one of those other dimensions, five, six, seven, eight, and onward? Or is it somewhere else further outside of that? That part we don't quite know, but the fourth dimensional consciousness is here. It could go there, or it could stay here in this dimension for a while. And that's where you have your ghosts and spirits and things like that. Um, it's just the consciousness hanging out here for a little while before going on. So I, I know that you say that all time exists now, and many of us have heard that, right? Time is an illusion. Time, there's only the now. And right. simultaneously, but each moment in time also has its own frequency. And so I know that it is hard for us to exist in time in the structure that we all co-created. At the same time, what seems so real is actually an illusion. How does time have its own frequency and also that everything exists now at the same time? Yeah, it's a little hard for the human mind to to kind of wrap its head around, uh, especially when we start thinking about things like reincarnation. Like, okay, if I'm if I'm reincarnating um, and all time is concurrent, exists, does that mean that all of my lives are here right now? And yes. <laughs> So wherever that source is, wherever we are, uh, wherever we really are, uh, we are projecting in multiple times uh, into this universe. And yeah, it's it's hard for the the, the mind to kind of wrap its head around that. But here's another analogy that I can use here, and I'm going to go back to um, I'm going to go back to computers just because it's at least for me easier to explain so you take um it was easier to explain this back a long time ago when um you had like game cartridges and cds and things like that we don't really use that so much anymore but we do have you know programs on our computers and things like that and all the information of that of that program or of that game or whatever it is is all there you're just not accessing it all at the same time because you're having an experience going through it. But all the information, all the data is actually there. Now, if I was the programmer, if I was outside of that, uh, I could choose where I want to go within the program, maybe make a little modification here or there, rewrite something, add something, that sort of thing. Uh, But as the uh, player or experiencer or the user of a program or something like that, I am kind of systematically going through it. 
you know, rather than having complete access to the whole thing, but all the data is there. So when we talk about things like uh, the collective unconscious, the Akashic records, what I call eternal knowledge, it's all accessible to us because it's all there. It's just a matter of find, trying to find that right key, trying to find that right frequency to access it. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things you bring up in the book with pictures was super creepy and it had to do with the conjuring. I, yeah. by the way, never, I can't see movies like that, but for whatever reason, I'm part of the actors union and they offered us um, at the Screen Actors Guild, they offered us to see the movie. I don't know why I went, but I went and I brought a friend. <laughs> I had a t-shirt bald in my mouth the whole time, like a horse with a bit to keep from screaming. It was just like, how did anyone live through this? And so you have something about the well room of the conjuring house. And you showed a picture of this, this combination of water and limestone and granite creating this buildup of energy affecting the rest of the house. Is that what you're talking about? How things can bleed through? How does that happen? Yeah, that in that story, there's a great example of a time slip. Um, and <laughs> The, the movie, The Conjuring, uh, they, they got maybe like 2% of it accurate. Like oh. They got the names right, you know. Okay. <laughs> it's Hollywood for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, they kind of, what they did was they they told a, a story uh, that they tried to encapsulate within a very short period of time. But the entire 10 years that the parents lived there, things were going on. And, and you know, it wasn't constant, like every single day. Some things were actually very good, very pleasant, even though you would call it supernatural in nature. And there are other things that were quite creepy uh, going on. Um, very good friends with the eldest daughter, Andrea. And um, I brought her on to my, uh, my docuseries, A Shadow Dimension, to talk about what she says is the most fascinating thing that ever happened there. Now, the movies depict a, you know, a, a possession and an exorcism and all that sort of thing. But actually, the big incident that happened with the Warrens was a seance that had gone bad. So um, the, the Johnson brothers had gotten the Warrens out there to do some paranormal investigations and they started, they started doing that. And uh, Lorraine wanted to do a seance in the house to try to communicate with the spirits that were there. And during this seance, something did take a hold of Carolyn and she was tossed back from the dining room into the parlor and was out cold. So Roger threw the Warrens out, and the Warrens were never allowed back. Um, but you know, Carolyn was okay, shook up, and um, and she was shook up for, for a while after that. So a couple of weeks, a month later, and um, Andrea was up late at night doing some homework, and her mother, Carolyn, had been asleep. Yeah, uh, woke up and asked Andrea if, because well, she had been asleep most of that day, if, but uh, asked Andrea if she could put on a short pot of coffee, reheat some of the dinner, and Andrea was like, yeah, sure, absolutely, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. So Carolyn sat down in the parlor where Andrea had been, and all of a sudden she sees morphing into existence in the dining room this family like out of the 1700s. So there was a woman cooking over an open hearth. And that fireplace at that particular time had been closed off for 100 years. But there it was open and fires raging and all this. There's a couple of children running around in the room. And then there are a couple of gentlemen sitting there with pewter steins. And they turn and they look at Carolyn. And the one guy kind of nudges the other and says, well, would you look at that? As if Carolyn was the ghost. And then just all kind of dissipated away. So it's these two moments in time that could see with that could see each other, recognize each other, interact with each other a little bit. Um, so that's what we'd call a time slip. And yeah, I believe that that house, a lot of what's going on there is powered by that well room because you have, uh, it's, it's in the basement, it's directly under that parlor. And it's, uh, you have an open well there with water in there to this day. Uh, the, Walls of the room were made of limestone, and they're capped with granite blocks. So it's like a little miniature version of a lot of the things that we see out in, in Egypt. And mm -hmm. so it's like a little mini power plant that's just powering that house. Oh, my goodness. And is she okay? <laughs> is the daughter okay? Is she, does she have PTSD? or? Well, she... I mean, she's she's talked about how she has her, her trilogy, House of Darkness, House of Light. 
Um, so, and I'd like to, uh, just say, you know, put a lot of energy out there for Andrea. Andrea is, um, is suffering from, from cancer right now. She's mm. going through chemo and all that. Uh, Carolyn just recently passed away here too. So, uh, so the family's really hurting right now. Uh, but yeah, they, I mean, they, they have survived that house and, um, uh, they've been willing to talk about it for a number of years now because The Conjuring came out 10 years ago now, something like that. Yeah. Yes. And I think it's even extraordinary that they lived in that house for 10 years. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they went through a lot there. Yeah. Absolutely. Have you ever had a UFO or extraterrestrial experience? Um, well, you could make a case that maybe that, uh, that incident that I had when I was eight um, was something interdimensional. Was it in extraterrestrial inter interdimensional extraterrestrial uh possibly yeah i was talking about coming from another space and was here to study humanity so mm -hmm. it, that's on the table um my one like kind of classic ufo incident um the one time i actually saw something in the sky i was actually driving down the highway in um missouri late one night probably six eight years ago something like that uh headed westward toward oklahoma and um, I noticed suddenly that there was these um, uh, two lights kind of very, uh, they were long and vertical in nature, uh, red, and they were kind of next to me in the air, um, just, you know, parallel to the highway, kind of um, just kind of shadowing the highway, almost kind of keeping pace with me. And I'm like, what the heck is that? I'm driving. What the heck is that? And then all of a sudden, one of the times that I looked up, just took off. And I was like, well, oh, I guess I just saw a UFO, you know, so pretty basic, but um, yeah, it's interesting. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And it can often be like that. They just present. I never know because I've had many of those and I never know, are they presenting to me? Are they aware of me? Or are they just, I'm able to see them because I've been in situations on a freeway where mm -hmm. no other car or truck saw it, but there were four of us in a truck and it was pretty extraordinary. Nobody right. else stopped. And we were like, really? It's hanging right here <laughs> on right the freeway. There. Yeah. Thank you for the gift. You know, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So then, Mike, how does the future influence the present? In what ways specifically? Yeah. So I, I think in a lot of ways, I think, um, you know, when... For instance, we're talking about um, you know two moments resonate at the same frequency. They blend, they uh, bleed into each other. So naturally, if you are if you're in that future moment and you're interacting with the past, well, whoever is there in the past, they're going to have a takeaway from that. So did given the conjuring, did those two gentlemen? Uh, you know, did they start talking about, you know, some sort of ghost story or there at the house? Uh, and maybe if they start talking about that, you know, were they seen as, you know, nuts or crazy, you know, given the time frame being the 1700s, it might not have been very popular uh, to talk about at that time. So that would definitely have some sort of influence on them. Um, you know, we, we see, I don't want to get too deep into it, but, um, the idea of the Mandela effect that, you know, if you, you know, went back into the past and changed something. Now, if you go out on Google and, you know, type in Mandela effect, you're going to find like a list of, you know, 50 different things. And a lot of it has to do with branding and nobody's going back in time to change the branding of Fruit Loops or Oscar Mayer or, or fruit of the loom or anything like that. But you could go back in time or interact with something in the past and have an influence that has that ripple effect, uh, you know, like the butterfly effect that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, little things change and we have that memory that lingers. A story I like to talk about, um, and this would be more on that idea of um, a frequency and vibration, something reverberating through time. So my fiance uh, and I, Jennifer and I, we've known each other since we were in first grade, we've known each other our entire lives. And um, we had this incident in first grade when we first uh, started knowing each other. And when this incident happened, we really didn't have any significant interaction up to this point, but we were in the school library one day and I'm just over at a stack of books, looking through some, some of the different books there, trying to find something that interests me. And all of a sudden she comes right up next to me and 
plants a kiss right on my cheek. And I'm like, whoa, what was that? You know, blushing and all this sort of thing. No idea what to think. And so, uh, and that was it, you know, it was like, okay, that was interesting. What was all that about? Um, it's not like she became my little girlfriend that year or anything like that. That would be later. We were in fourth grade together, seventh grade. Um, we did date. I mean, we were 12 years old. So, you know, <laughs> we quite a, kind of quote unquote dated for a month in seventh grade. And I was too scared to hold her hand. So she broke up with me. <laughs> it's cute. But, um, but then in eighth grade, I moved away. And that's when I moved from uh, Massachusetts to Ohio. And then we, we lost contact. We were out of touch with each other for 21 years. And so, you know, the advent of social media and Facebook and all that stuff, we reconnected. I was married at the time. She was with somebody at the time. So, you know, we're just, you know, friends catching up, how you doing that sort of thing. And, um, every once in a while our paths would cross, we'd get together for dinner and catch up and all that. Nothing, nothing romantic. But during that time I asked her, what the heck was the deal with the kiss on the cheek? And she would kind of shrug her shoulders. I don't know. Just, you know, something told me, you know, to, to kiss your cheek. Okay. Um, so 2022, um, I had a tour to Ireland and we were both single at the time. She came on that tour and we just really hit it off and we got together. So, we, um, as part of our dating, we went back to our old hometown. Her parents still live there. Um, so visited with, with her parents and then we decided to, you know, go visit our old haunt. So we went back to that elementary school, which is, uh, now part of the university there. They have it as a performing arts center. So we're just, you know, walking the grounds, looking through windows. Oh, you know, there's one of our old classrooms, that sort of thing. We went to where the library was. And they haven't now set up as like a small music room, but we're pointing at the spot through the window. Hey, there's the spot where the kiss happened. And all of a sudden, Jennifer starts yelling through the window, kiss him, kiss him. And we're laughing and, you know, think it's funny and all that stuff. But then as we're driving away, it dawns on us, wait a minute. Jennifer had said something told her to kiss my cheek. Was it her 40-something-year-old self back through time, yelling through that window that actually told her to kiss my cheek in the first place. Yeah. I love that story. Yeah. I love that story for so many reasons. I mean, first of all, I completely understand the idea of reconnecting mm. with somebody from school, from growing up. There is yeah. a dynamic, there's a magnetism there. There's an understanding, a depth that you don't get with somebody else. So kudos right. that you have come back together and your fiancés. And I just think it's mind blowing to be there, both of you at the mm -hmm. same time while she's calling through the window and knowing that quite possibly that on the other side in another time that there she is receiving herself calling right. to her, kiss him, kiss him. And then she actually says, boy, I don't know where this is coming from, but I'll do it. <laughs> right. It's, it's so beautiful. And you know, it reminds me a lot. I have a friend, um, he was born in Germany. He had actually an incredibly traumatic background uh, as somebody who grew up through the war, but a different side of the war. Mm -hmm. And um, his mother died, his father, you know, was an alcoholic, his mother got cancer very young and died. And he was whisked away without anybody explaining to him we're putting you in an orphanage. Oh, so wow. imagine the shock. He thinks he's going on this fun trip and he gets dropped off in an orphanage. Nobody's told him. Nobody's even told him his mother's dying. So it's amazing. He's as wonderful and functional as he is. Mm -hmm. And all through his time at the orphanage, he kept getting visited by this man who is in dark, in shadow. The man is always dressed in black. And this friend of mine, by the way, is a psychic medium. So okay. he's already gifted as a child and he's terrified of this man who keeps showing up and keeps engaging with him. So he's constantly running from him. And so it's a big part of his story. He's written a book and he's interviewed a lot. But here's what's amazing is that as an adult, he's he's in some therapy to get some help, obviously, because it's a traumatic background. As he's getting help, he suddenly realizes, he looks down at himself and realizes, I always dress in black. Yeah. That was me going back to me to rescue me and be there for me. 
And it's yeah. such a beautiful story. Yeah, that really is. It really, really is. And um, that reminds me of, you know, some of the different stories that I included in in the book. Um, I call it the doppelganger effect, where um, a lot of times when people think that they're having what we would call a doppelganger experience, a lot of times when they see themselves or they might not even realize it's themselves. Um, and they're like, it's this, it's this doppelganger or whatever. It, 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 no, it is them. So like um, the famous poet Goethe, you know, walking down uh, the street one day is headed toward Dresselheim. Uh, to uh, he's having an affair with a young woman, and he sees off on the side of the road this uh, this man in this gold trimmed gray suit, and you know he's you know turns and looks to get a um, or turns to get a better look at him, and disappears. He's like, whoa, what the heck happened there? But years later, he's walking down uh, the same road, in the opposite direction, and getting up to that spot, and he looks down like, oh my god. I was the guy in the gold trim gray suit because I'm wearing it right now. So, um, so yeah, just incidents like that. Um, I also have another one in there about the um, little boy uh, walks into the kitchen one day at home and sees this you know, hooded shadow figure over by the kitchen table, scares him to death and runs out of the room and becomes the hooded shadow figure story of the household for years. And then one day as a, as a young man, he's at the kitchen table one day making a sandwich. Uh, he's wearing a hoodie and all of a sudden in the doorway, he sees this short, you know, shadow figure walk in and then dart right back out. And he's like, Oh my God, it was me the whole time. I was the tall, dark hooded shadow figure. I'm by the table right now wearing the hoodie, you know, all that. So it was himself all along. Yeah. Those stories mm -hmm. like that are fascinating. Oh, it's amazing how we show up for ourselves. And and it's great when we can take the time to discover there actually is nothing frightening going on. There's actually a lot of love yeah. and being taken care of and held in this moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great stories. Thank you for that. Absolutely. I know towards the end of your time travel book, Mike, you write that time travel is possible right now. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you said earlier. So I'm going to hearken back to it. You say by using consciousness, by meditating, yeah. by matching the frequency of that moment in time that we want to experience. So that also means that we can shift or move between timelines, move between parallel universes. So have you yourself done this? Have you matched frequency and visited another time or a parallel reality? Yeah. So when, and I, I actually start the book off with this story. Um, when I was 14 years old, after making that move from Massachusetts to Ohio, I was homesick. You know, I, I spent 10 years growing up there, had a lot of close friends and I missed them. So on the, uh, one year anniversary, I decided, and it, I was really inspired by the movie somewhere in time where, ba where Christopher Reeve, uh, his character, Richard basically wills himself from 1980 back to 1912. And, you know, he does this all um, he by setting up his room to look like it was back in 1912. He He's playing subliminal messages, all this stuff to basically trick his mind into believing he's back in 1912. Um, and Richard Matheson, who wrote that story, he well, he wrote the book and then he wrote the screenplay. Um, he based his work on... Um, on, on real theories in time. So when you actually read the the book, he talks about going to a bookstore and getting these uh, books on on time. And the the books that he talks about in his are actual real books, like Man and Time by J.B. Priestley. It actually has almost like a mini book review uh, in the Somewhere in Time uh, novel, which is really interesting. So it's based all this on real principles. And so as you know, I didn't know all those details when I was fourteen. Um, but at 14, I have this idea, okay, let me try it like I saw in the movie and see if I can take myself back in time to a point before we move so I can visit my, my friends one last time. And so, um, I had, had no idea what I was doing. Um, but I was lying down in bed and, um, I essentially put myself into a deep meditative state again, not really knowing that I was putting myself into a meditative state, but that's where it gotten to. And I started feeling these like undulating waves back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, that was, that was, that was fine with that was kind of a relaxing feeling go back and forth. But then I started to feel this, um, electrostatic tingly type feel and that spooked me and I snapped right back out of it. Um, again, 
wasn't sure what I was doing at the time, but years later, as you know, talking to people and learning about all these different things, I was like, oh, I was on the I was on the brink of having an out-of-body experience. I was about to project somewhere. The question is, was I just going to you know, project into the room where I was there, or was I really going to go back in time? Like I was, because I had set that intention. Was I going to go back in time? And that's the big question. I have attempted it since then, but um, my, <laughs> I've got so much going on. My brain is too cluttered and it won't shut off enough. I do meditate every day, uh, but I have a really, really hard time trying to get into a good meditative state to be able to try something like that. Mm -hmm. But I believe that somebody can get themselves into that deep meditative state, setting that intention uh, going forward, they could uh, actually time travel. So cool. Um, you know, so for people who are interested in this book in particular, or your new book, or any of your other books, where can they go to get the book? Yeah, they can just go to my website, MikeRicksecker.com. I've got the latest book right on the front page, Portals. Uh, to the stars. But if you go to my book section, you'll find them all listed there. Uh, and of course, you can go Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all those sites as well, if you wish. Beautiful. I have to admit to you, I have to confess to you that I am a certified wine specialist, specifically oh. <laughs> in Spanish wines and in Italian wines. And so here I am researching you, Mike, and I'm like, oh, He's a winemaker. Oh my <laughs> God, this yeah. is so big. <laughs> Will you talk about that? What do you do around wine and your passion? Yeah. Share a little. Um, yeah, it's something that my dad got me into um, a good 15, 16 years ago, something like that. Um, and so, yeah, it was. it's my mother's fault. Um, <laughs> she had gotten him, uh, she thought it would be interesting as like a little hobby or whatever. She got him a, a wine kit for oh. Christmas one year. And so you know, he's playing around with it, made it. He's like, oh, this is great. And so he introduced me to it. We, we started doing this together. So it's a really nice father-son thing that we do. We, we we go over to his house. He's got a whole setup for it. And um, yeah, I make all kinds of different ones. I've been making the wine for um, for the wedding. So it's uh, it, actually, that's all aging right now. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. That is like really wine. special. Very yeah, special. And so where do you get your grapes from and what kind of grapes do you like to major in you and your dad? Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll kind of mix it up sometimes. There's, uh, we have local, uh, vineyards and wineries here that we can, we get, uh, grapes from. Sometimes you can buy it as the juice, um, or you can just, you know, get a commercial kit or something like that. So we kind of mix that up a bit. Uh, Ohio is, um, pretty well known for uh, like Catawba grapes, uh, Concord grapes, things like that. So those type of wines, uh, using the grapes uh, uh, here locally, um, those are the good ones to make. Um, something that's like, like I'll, I will do some uh, Italian wines or something like that. Those are, are better if I just get the kit. And recently here, I took a Merlot that I made um, along with a uh, Sangiovese. Mm. And blended them to make a uh, a super Tuscan. So, yes, yeah. exactly. I was gonna say a very powerful, full bodied experience. Yes. yes. Yum. Well, that's a lot of fun. Oh, I still I'm I I am still a member of the North American Sommelier Association. I'm not a oh. sommelier. I am a yes. specialist. Uh, there is a difference. However, they yes. know my obsession, my passion mm -hmm. with this. And they invite me to all the trade things that they do, which I love. I learn a ton. I get to do all these incredible tastings. Yeah. yeah. Wine yeah, is a it's, beautiful thing. Yeah. And it's a nice tradition that seems like it's, you know, getting handed down. So my father and I have been doing this for a while, but my middle son is a sommelier. So, <laughs> so he's taking, he's taking up the mantle. So, yeah. It's lovely. Um, well, cheers to you and your son and your dad. I think yeah. that's really incredible. You are presenting February 7th through the 10th, 2025, Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo. You will be there. And again, folks, the link to get your tickets is in the show notes. So, Mike, what are you talking about? What are you presenting at CLE? Yeah, so um, Friday night, I'm a part of the Ancient Secrets panel that uh, Jimmy Church is hosting. So that'll be that'll be fascinating. A lot of uh, uh, great minds that are on that panel. Uh, on Saturday, I'm doing a uh, workshop for uh, travels through time, essentially. 
And last year I did just a small lecture on it and uh, it was really, it really kind of short changed. I, I thought people, because you know, those are only 45 minutes and this really is an hour and a half uh, presentation. So we're doing the uh, Travels Through Time workshop and then I'm doing a lecture on Sunday on uh, portals and stargates. I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. And again, your website, Mike, and then folks, you spell it Rick, R-I-C-K, Secker, S-E-C-K-E-R dot com. And anything you'd like to share with us here at the end, and especially, got to ask you this question, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams or goals? Oh, I, I have a lot that's on the table right now. So, of course, um, Portals to the Stars and Travels Through Time, they are part of a series that I started writing a couple of years ago here called Connecting the Universe. So the third installment of that is coming up. I have the... Uh, the follow-up film to The Shadow Dimension that is in post-production right now. And I'm also looking to get back to a bit of my fiction work as well. So that's actually, that's actually where I started was in, uh, write, I was writing mystery novels, but I have some sci-fi fantasy stuff in mind that, uh, that I'm going to be working on. So, oh my goodness. There's yeah. a huge audience for that, which is yeah. kind of like everybody I know. Amazing. Thank you so much for today, Mike. It was beautiful getting to know you. Thank you for sharing your work. And again, you know, thanks for stepping up and really doing this in such a big way because we all learn from it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Debbie, for having me today. It's been a wonderful conversation and I sincerely appreciate it. Yes, always. And folks, I end today's show with this quote regarding the stacked time theory. The past, present, and future exist simultaneously like layers in a stack, with our perception of time merely a movement through this pre-existing structure. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream. Do leave a comment and share. And in the coming weeks on the show, you will be enjoying the amazing Suzanne Giesman, Teal Swan, Daryl Anka, Rebecca Dawson, Thomas Winterton, Marie Diamond, Paul Hynek, and Barbara Lamb. So if you have not yet subscribed to the show, do it today so you're sure to be in on all these conversations or go to my website, debbiedashinger.com, get your free gift there. And also you'll be aware of all these beautiful things for free coming down the pike for you. Thanks for joining us today on Dare to Dream.